Welcome everyone to today's webinar presentation, What Does It Take to Be Compassionate in Today's Healthcare Environment? The Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to strengthening the relationship between patients and their clinical caregivers and preserving the human connection in healthcare. Today's program will discuss questions such as, is it possible for us to provide compassionate care to patients and their families in today's fast-paced, high-demand healthcare environment? What does compassionate care look like? And how can we sustain our resilience so that we can offer compassionate care to those who are ill and vulnerable? Today's program will also discuss the components and process of compassion the personal qualities and skills that make compassion possible, the impact of work-related distress on compassion, as well as helpful strategies for deepening and sustaining our compassion for patients, their families, and ourselves. My name is Lynn Osborne, and I'm the Director of Business Development at the Short Center for Compassionate Healthcare, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's session. Before we introduce today's speaker, Let's go over a few details about the webinar. It is 60 minutes in length. The first 50 minutes of the program will be presentation, followed by a 10-minute question and answer session. Today's program is being recorded and will be available on the Short Center website a few days after the session. Please note that attendees are participating in listening-only mode, but can interact with the speaker and me by using the questions pane located within your webinar management toolbar, which should be appearing on the right side of your screen. If you have questions during the session, please just type them into the questions pane and send them to us, and we will address them verbally at the end of the formal program. If time does not allow us to answer all the questions, your questions will be forwarded on to the speaker, who will get back to you with those answers via email after the session. We will also be polling the audience during the session, and we hope you will participate in this measurement tool. Finally, as you exit the webinar, you will receive an electronic survey that we hope you will take a minute to complete so that we may measure your satisfaction level regarding today's program. Your feedback is really important to us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who is Beth Lown. Dr. Lown is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the medical director of the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare. Beth develops programs to strengthen patient-caregiver relationships, speaks nationally and internationally about compassion, effective communication, and relationships in healthcare, and leads the Schwartz Center's National Consensus Project on Compassionate Healthcare. Welcome, Beth. Thank you, Lynn. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here today, and we have a lot talk about, so I'm actually going to just jump right in, and as always, I'd like to begin with a story. Some years ago, a previously healthy 40-year-old man fell ill with a persistent cough, low-grade temp, weakness, fatigue. His primary care doc was overbooked, couldn't see him, so we saw another member of this practice, and he was given a course of antibiotics for what was thought to be an atypical pneumonia. And then several visits later, back and forth, he still wasn't feeling well. And unable to see his primary care physician, he also was feeling uncared for. So he made the decision to go to see another doctor, went to another institution, and three months after the onset of his symptoms, he was diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer. Now, the year was 1994, and the patient was Ken Schwartz. When Ken arrived for his initial lung biopsies, the nurse who did his screening interview was harried, she was brusque, until Ken shared with her the fact that he had just learned he had advanced lung cancer. That nurse noticed the sadness, the fear in his face. She paused and she asked, how are you doing? The next day, that nurse went down to look for him, found him as he was waiting to be wheeled into the operating room, held his hand and wished him well. Ken wrote in his Boston Globe magazine article that was published in July 1995, this small gesture was powerful. My apprehension gave way to a much needed moment of calm. I realized that in a high volume setting, the high pressure atmosphere tends to stifle a caregiver's inherent compassion and humanity. 
but the briefest pause in the frenetic pace can bring out the best in a caregiver and do much for a terrified patient. Ken's family and his oncology care team sustained him through periods of fear and deep despair. From his physician, of course he needed clinical expertise, but he also needed compassion and hope. And I don't mean hope for some miraculous cure, but for the certainty that his doctor would provide the best available treatment to extend his life as long as its quality was acceptable. And hope that as long as he was alive, he would have expert physicians and nurses who cared deeply, not just about his clinical condition, but about him as a person. Ken wrote, if I've learned anything, it is that we never know when, how, or whom a serious illness can strike. If and when it does, each of us wants not simply the best possible care for our body, but for our whole being. Ken Schwartz was diagnosed with lung cancer in November of 1994, and he died in September 1995. And what mattered most to him was the compassionate care he received from his caregivers that, in his words, made the unbearable bearable. So let me ask you this question. Do you think this kind of care is important? We actually asked this question of a nationally representative sample of 800 recently hospitalized patients and 510 physicians in this study that we reported in the journal Health Affairs. And what we found was that patients and physicians alike confirmed the importance of strong relationships, effective communication, and emotional support, even saying that it could make a difference in whether a patient lives or dies. And then we asked, does the U.S. health care system provide compassionate care? Just think for a second about how you would respond to this, and let me show you what they said. In our study, nearly half of the patients said no, and 42% of the physicians said no. And then we ask, do most health care professionals provide compassionate care? And again, think about how you would respond to this. Let me show you what we found. In our study, 46% of patients, again, almost half, said no, but only 22% of physicians said that they didn't think that most healthcare professionals were providing compassionate care. So there is a disconnect between what patients feel they're receiving and what physicians believe they're providing. Now, it's a little bit daunting to think about how to change the healthcare system, but this is Harvey Feinberg. He is the president of the Institute of Medicine, and he said at a meeting that we convened last year, the kickoff for our National Consensus Project, a compassionate healthcare system begins with compassionate people. Guess what? We are the system. So today, we're going to focus in on the components and process of compassion, the impact of work-related distress on compassion, and some strategies that we can use to sustain ourselves so that we can provide compassion to others. Now, to be compassionate, you kind of have to notice that someone is distressed, and this drawing by a little seven-year-old girl kind of says it all. Here she is. She's sitting on the exam table, and there in the exam room is her older sister, her mom, who's holding her baby sister, and there in the corner, pecking away at the computer, is her beloved pediatrician. Now, I don't know about you, but many clinicians I know lament that they are spending an awful lot of time fighting with the computer or with insurance companies, managing systems, rather than being able to focus on the patient. But when we do, when we focus our full attention on the patient, it initiates a process of human connection that all by itself can be healing, and not just for the patient, for us too, because that human connection is restorative. It helps us remember why we went into medicine why we chose this field, and it reinforces our sense of ourselves as healers. Focusing our attention, though, really requires us to consciously set aside all the noise in our heads so that we can actually notice and perceive the patient's distress. And I, I actually use something I call a doorknob strategy, which I've taught to my practice partners. So before I enter an exam room or a hospital room, in a disciplined way, I consciously put my hand on the doorknob and set aside all of the tasks, the to-do list, the chatter in my mind, so that when I cross that threshold, 
I can fully receive the patient on the other side of that door. And then we activate all these neural circuits in our brain. And similar circuits are activated whether we are experiencing pain or distress or when we are perceiving it in other people. This is an automatic phenomenon. People sometimes call this experience sharing or affective empathy. And then within milliseconds, these other parts of the brain start to get activated, and these are associated with cognitive processes, thinking processes. We start thinking about what it is we're seeing. And some people call this mentalizing or cognitive empathy. It's about trying to understand what the patient is experiencing, the patient's perspective. And in the real world, actually, both of these pathways are co-activated. And our responses are modulated by a lot of different factors related to the patient, related to ourselves, and the organizational cultures and the systems that we are all working in. So what happens when time constraints, the culture of medicine, organizational climate, some people call this the hidden curriculum, what happens when these things actually blind us to the experiences and the suffering of patients. Now take a look at this painting and think about what this artist is trying to portray. What makes this really remarkable to me is that this was actually painted by a third year medical student. And this group of eight and a half medical students, they can't see that whole person lying in the bed in front of them. They can't see that person. And they can't see each other and they can't see themselves. They are blinded to perception, experiences, and feelings. And I'll just tell you a really quick story. Many years ago, I was making rounds uh, on the wards with a group of physicians, and we were seeing a young man in sickle cell crisis with a painful knee. And I was going through all these demonstrations, the signs of the uh, fluid in the knee, and then we left the room. And I asked one of the physicians how they were managing this patient's pain, and he replied, Ugh, they're all just drug seekers. Now, this was just one person's response to this particular patient's suffering, but there is extensive research demonstrating that in high volume, time pressured settings, when we are faced with complicated clinical problems, especially ones that are associated with uncertainty, physicians at least rely on these mental shortcuts, they're called heuristics, to make decisions about diagnosis and treatment. And these conditions, these same conditions, high volume, time pressure, uncertainty, all of these activate unconscious stereotypes and bias which suspend compassion and lead to errors and to disparities in care. These all have to be addressed in our educational efforts. In order to feel compassion, we have to care about the patient. We have to value the patient's welfare. So when we do focus our attention, when our neural networks are all lit up and resonating and activated, we perceive the patient's needs and we value the patient's welfare, when these conditions are in place, then we awaken empathic concern or compassion, which is really the state of feeling for another. But in order to really understand the unique way in which patients are distressed or suffering, First, we light up this incredible compassion family of other-oriented emotions related to tenderness, kindness, a kind of professional love, all the way through sorrow and grief at that person's plight. We still, though, have to figure out, well, this is a, each person is unique. What is, in what ways, what is the unique way in which this particular person is distressed or suffering? So we have to be able to understand how this person, how the patient is making sense of his or her illness. That's the explanatory model. What is this? How does it work in my body? What her hopes and preferences are, needs, concerns, fears, and the broader social and cultural context in which all of these are occurring. And all of this requires the personal qualities of non-judgment, openness, respect, caring kindness, and the ability to be truly present. If we project ourselves into a patient's situation and assume that they are feeling what we would feel, we may well be mistaken. So we really also need listening, relational, and communication skills. And it's only then 
that we can begin to discern how to act with compassion and realize that sometimes being present and listening is as important as taking action. Now, I, I really want to make it clear that having concerns, experiencing distress, suffering, these are universal, everyday human experiences, especially in healthcare. They're not something that just occurs at the end of life. Compassionate care is essential to all healthcare interactions, every time, all the time. So we're with a patient, we need to explore what's important to that patient and to ask ourselves how we can work together to figure out a pathway forward that is consistent with the patient's preferences and our sense of what's appropriate and that's based on mutual respect. And this act of co-creating the path can be transformative for both patients and caregivers. And I'd, I'd like to illustrate this with a story. And this is, this is Sandra's story. So years ago, I met Sandra. She had a very serious autoimmune disorder that compromised her lung function, amongst other things. And she had been hospitalized six times in eight months in the ICU on a ventilator. And everything that she loved and valued, she felt had just been stripped away from her, her independence, being with her family, participating in that activities. And she just felt she just couldn't go on. Now, she was young. But she had made up her mind. She prepared advanced directives. And the next time she wound up in the emergency room, she refused intubation. And the emergency room staff went nuts. They were trying to persuade her to change her mind. You're young. We could save you. She had prepared herself. She wouldn't budge. And then this pulmonologist came, pul pulmonologist came in to speak with her. I can't face it again, she said. So instead of telling her all the reasons, well, she should consent to treatment. He quietly asked her, what is it you can't face? Tell me what we could do differently. Now let me read her words here. The restraints, I feel like an animal. They tell me I have to be restrained because I'm agitated, but I'm trying to get free. He assured me he would not allow me to be restrained. He told me he would stay with me until I was stable and calm. If he had to leave, he would leave explicit orders to call him if I became restless. No one would have permission to restrain me. And the morphine, I don't want to be doped up all the time. I need to be able to ask for it when I need it. Sometimes it's more important for me to be alert so I don't slip away into the rhythm of that machine, breathing in and out, in and out. He showed me the order sheet as he wrote a PRN order for morphine. Our conversation couldn't have taken more than five or six minutes, but it was a powerful force. I could feel myself slipping into the dreaminess that would end my life if I refused the ventilator. Literally, this man stood between me and death. He took my hands, looked at me, and said, I don't want you to die. In a few minutes, you'll be unconscious, but I won't do this if you say no. We can work together on this. Those words conquered my fear, the fear of having no control in my life. He was willing to make my wishes primary. In that moment, he returned my humanity to me. I nodded agreement. He did keep his part of the bargain to honor the things I didn't want and made the next few days easier to endure. This time, the ventilator didn't possess me. It was different because I was able to say no no to restraints. I could reach the call button. No to scheduled morphine. I could decide if it was more important to have relief from pain or to be more conscious. No to isolation. I had a pencil and paper and could communicate. I had choices, and I was able to make decisions about important aspects of my care. This brief dialogue pulled me back from the only decision I thought I had left to make. One human soul reaching out to another made space between two extreme options. Either yes, agreeing to everything the doctor ordered, or the final no. This story is always just amazing to me. This woman, she was young at the time, she survived. She went into remission and she told me this story some at least 20 years after it had happened. There are so many remarkable aspects to this story, not the least of which is the compassion that flowed there. 
But what really strikes me every time I read this is that, that these two people together, they created a pathway forward that neither one of them could possibly have imagined alone. And this, I think, is transformative compassion. So what is compassion exactly? This is one definition. Compassion is other oriented emotions that are elicited by perceiving another's concerns, distress, and suffering coupled with altruistic motivation and actions to ameliorate, to lighten the other's distress. People often ask me, what's the difference between compassion and empathy? And there's a lot of debate and disagreement about this, so this is my take on it. I think that compassion is the other-oriented emotional response. Compassion is feeling for, empathy is feeling with, standing in another person's shoes, and compassion is associated with a desire to transform suffering. And this is the empathy altruism hypothesis. This is C.D. Batson's work. He's a very, very accomplished researcher, social psychologist, and he says that in the presence of compassion, human beings experience empathy-induced altruism, which is a state in which the ultimate goal is increasing another's welfare rather than our own. This is really the foundation of what some people call professionalism, right? So let me show you this model that we're developing here uh, based on a lot of work by other very accomplished people. And it's shown linearly, but these are not linear processes. They all meld into each other. They all influence each other. But we start with focusing our attention. And then we experience this process in our brains, this automatic thing called neural resonance. We perceive a patient's needs, which awakens empathic concern. And if we value the patient's well-being, we become motivated to improve that person's state and to lighten distress and suffering. And then we can create, with the patient or a family member, a compassionate path forward that most effectively integrates our clinical expertise with the patient's needs. And at the heart of this model is the well-being of every clinician and every single member of the healthcare team. The trouble is, in today's healthcare environment, I think many of us are feeling like this, right? You probably not need to detail these, but we are exposed, all of us in healthcare, to an awful lot of occupational hazards. I think we're notorious for our self-neglect. Then there's pathological altruism. We give, 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 give until we just are completely depleted and we fall off the cliff. There's burnout, and the statistics on that are really uh, very unhappy. Uh, 30 to 60 percent of health professionals experience burnout. It's higher for medical residents, up to 75 percent in one survey. And this statistic I find completely shocking. Uh, the incidence of suicide is 40 percent greater than the general population for male physicians and 130 percent greater for women physicians. How come this isn't an emergency? Those who are exposed to prolonged or to others suffering in emergency room trauma, experienced vicarious suffering, tra secondary trauma. Then there's moral distress, knowing what the right thing is to do but being unable to do it. And then, of course, there's exposure to disrespectful behaviors, bullying, even abuse, which is what some people think degrades our students and our trainees' compassion that they come to us with. So instead of experiencing path concern, I think many health professionals and staff are experiencing personal distress, trying to reduce their own distress and suffering, and that results in using defense, defense mechanisms like avoidance and detachment. We actually do know from uh, functional MRI studies that experienced physicians downregulate their empathy. And you can see how it can be helpful because it can protect us to some extent, but it also contributes to the deadening of our souls. So what are we supposed to be doing here? Are we supposed to be encouraging the upregulation of empathic concern, downregulation to avoid burnout? And then, of course, there's the system, heavy workloads, administrative, operational requirements, discontinuity, there's fragmentation of care, 
Sometimes our values conflict with organizational values. There's a sense of loss of control. And there is a very sad sense of loss of community with colleagues. Many of us feel like we're really living in a vacuum, in isolation. So the key question, I really think it's a burning question, is what determines whether we'll experience compassion or personal distress, and what can we do about it? Now, our compassion capacity is clearly linked with our own sense of well-being. It's certainly influenced also, though, by the cultures of the groups and the organizations that we work in. We simply cannot provide compassion for others consistently, reliably, if we ourselves are depleted. And we at the Schwartz Center do believe that systemic change is needed to enable clinicians and teams and staff to reliably provide compassionate care, and we will be issuing a call to action with some thoughts and recommendations about this in the near future. But change has to occur at all levels, and there are some personal strategies that we can use to strengthen our resilience and to deepen our capacity for compassion. And I'm always endlessly inspired by the words of Viktor Frankl. Some of you may know of this remarkable man. He was a psychiatrist and a concentration camp survivor. And he said, in the wake of that incredible experience, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedom, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances to choose one's own way. We can empower ourselves to choose another way. We can choose to honor our own well-being and the well-being of our patients. We can choose to deepen our compassion, which actually serves both of these purposes. So this is an exercise that you can do at home. You can do it on your own. It helps clarify what makes your work meaningful to you your own way. And you can do this actually with coworkers and groups and then discuss these actions that made the experience meaningful, the conditions that made it possible, and how to make it happen more often. So it's a great exercise to try. But just for a moment, think about a time in healthcare when you felt your work was meaningful and you felt happy and fulfilled. I'd like to hear a story from one or two of our participants. And I think the first person that we're going to hear from is Becca. Becca, can you share your story? I'm not sure I can hear Becca. Maybe others can. Is Les available? Oh, he yeah. also. Hi. Uh, hi. There you are. Is that you, Becca? having some audio difficulties. How about Les? Is Les available online? Hey, Beth. This is Les. I'm on. Hey, can you hear hi. Me? I can hear you fine. I hope our other guests can as well. What, what about you, Les? Can you share a story about this kind of a, a work-related experience when you really felt you were working at the top of your meaningful potential? Well, yes, I can. As a matter of fact, it was a patient that I'd seen Friday. Huh. And her name is yes, and her, her name is Helen, and I've been her doctor for 15 years. Uh -huh. Been through a number of med medical problems, including spinal stenosis surgery, angina, TNA, TIA, but she is very tough and irascible. Uh huh. Uh huh. For everyone who uh, doesn't know these these abbreviations, TIAs is a transient oh, okay. ischemic attack, like a stroke. Go ahead. Okay, so she's a tough and irascible little old lady. She's 93. She weighs 83. <laughs> At any rate, recently her problems have been depression and social isolation. As a widow, she moved to my area to be near her sons, one of whom died of a brain tumor four years ago. She got depressed, and I was able to connect her to a nurse therapist named Marie who gave her useful support. And Helen, however needing, still refused all offers of antidepressant medicines, declaring they all had made her sick whenever she tried them in the past. Mm -hmm. She had lived in an in-law department apartment with her other son. He ran into financial difficulties about two years ago and moved himself and family away without taking Helen, leaving her with limited funds to move into subsidized elderly housing. Still independent, but a trip down the socioeconomic ladder then at the age of 91 and with decreasing social contact and growing estrangement from her son. Mm -hmm. 
She became paranoid and depressed and was even hospitalized over paranoid ideas about being broken into, and I can't say that some details aren't utterly believable. Mm -hmm. But she experienced that hospitalization as a betrayal by Marie, who had been party to the admission, and even by me to the extent I had endorsed it on the face value of the details at the time. Yes. I was able to restore my relationship with her, but she remained isolated and grew more depressed. She realized she, was, she needed Marie, her therapist, but wasn't comfortable seeing her. So I called Marie and I told her Helen would come back and she could affirm that Marie was really on her side. And this did happen. On the medication front, I persuaded her that I would try meds very cautiously. She agreed to a test dose of an antidepressant medicine at one half the usual dose in the morning if I could see her that afternoon to make sure it was well tolerated. And over a few steps, we've now gotten her an adequate dose of the antidepressant medication. Uh -huh. And finally, when her son appeared with her, I asked them to avoid going into areas of contention between them, that there was no point in revisiting their irreconcilable versions of the past. And they agreed to move on. And as a result, she'll be going to his new time for the very new home for the very first time at Thanksgiving. And where's this new home? Yeah, in Charlestown. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. So, okay. She's a, okay, so. Now, let me ask you, Les, so what, what made you feel that this was really meaningful, that you really felt good about this interaction you had with her? What was, what was it about that? Well, first of all, I have a very long and affectionate relationship with her. Yeah, and she had yeah, been yeah. so, so stuck, refusing meds, refusing to make peace with her son, refusing to go back to the therapist. The fact that I was instrumental in sort of getting all those, everything back on the same page and her feeling markedly better is just very gratifying. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So, I mean, really it rests on, in part, on your long-standing relationship with her and, if I dare say, your professional love for her, right. your advocacy for her, just knowing her incredibly well and your own expertise in really knowing what to do. Right, so I'm a biopsychosocial kind of guy, and I felt like these all came into play for her. Yeah, exactly uh, right, and served her well, along with your compassion. And well, okay. uh, I, yeah, I was Go able ahead. to devote enough time. I was able to give her enough time to do this too, to yeah. see her frequently for long enough each time to make sure that there was momentum gathered to be able to help her. Yep. So I think your your caring for her really sustained her until she could find a place that was more peaceful for her to be. All right. Well, thank you, Les. Thanks so much for sharing that story. I know there are many, many other stories to hear out there, and I would encourage you to talk about this and to think about how to make these acts of compassion, knowing the whole person, how to make these happen more frequently. You know, it turns out that compassion is really good medicine. And if you look at slide 31, you will see that it helps us heal those who are distressed and suffering. It reminds us why we chose the work that we do. It nurtures our sense of well-being and the well-being of the people that we serve. Compassion creates a sense of meaning. It creates purpose for us, and it reminds us of our common humanity. Compassion is good medicine. It heals us. It heals others. But you know what? It's not just something that happens. This is a Hungarian psychologist. His name is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, and he's actually best known for his work on creativity and the experience of flow. I don't know if you've heard of this. This is a a pleasurable state of concentration and immersion in an activity when you really feel like you're working at the peak of your abilities. And Csikszentmihalyi says that happiness and flow experiences, they have to be prepared for. They don't just happen. They have to be prepared for, cultivated, and defended. And the way to do that is by, in part, learning to control how we think about and respond to challenges and set new goals just like Viktor Frankl was saying. So let's think about some strategies that people use to manage challenges and to stay buoyant in these stormy seas of healthcare. 
So these are some common strategies that people use just to stay afloat, but also to cope with adversity. adversity. They're actually really, really helpful a lot of the time. And I, I learned this model uh, under not so happy circumstances because the Israel Trauma Coalition came and taught it to us in the wake of the Boston Marathon bombings. But we're interested to see which of these strategies you all use. So Lynn, let's take a quick poll and see what kinds of strategies our participants use to strengthen their resilience. Thank you, Beth. We're um, going to ask our audience to participate in our webinar here. If you guys could take a look at the screen um, and answer the question, what top two strategies do you use to strengthen your resilience? And what we're asking if you could choose your top two. I know it says please select, select all that apply, but if you could just give us your top two, and I'm going to read in a little bit more detail, belief systems, finding meaning through core beliefs, values, spirituality, and religion. The second choice, sharing, expressing feelings, being with friends, family, and others. Third, Imagination, enjoying the arts, literature, and writing. Cognition, gathering information, prioritizing, and planning. And physiology, exercise, meditation, sports, and relaxation. Uh, so if you could again, please select the, your top two strategies that you use when you're dealing with trying to strengthen your own resilience. We greatly appreciate your input. All right, votes are coming in. Um, Again, we're looking at the uh, five choices of belief systems, sharing, imagination, cognition, and physiology. And we've got some good responses at this point, so let's close the poll and share the results. Um, so the feedback from our audience, Beth, is 59% use belief systems, 76% sharing, 23% imagination, 24% cognition, and 34% physiology. How does that stack up with what your expectations were, Beth? Yeah, it's actually it's really, really fun and interesting. Um, in the past when I've seen this poll done, it's been, um, the, the, the results have been weighted because more physicians answered, and they're into cognition, hands down, cognition. But sharing um, is char more characteristics of the nursing profession. So I think we must have a mix of people out there listening. It's just it's fun and it's interesting. But I do want you to remember these strategies because they are really helpful in promoting resilience, taking care of yourself. These are important self-care strategies. I want Excellent. to go into um, thanks, Lynn. So thank um, you, and let's continue with the presentation. Sure thing. I'm, I'm, I'd like to talk about a couple of other things. These are um, listed here, some ways of preparing for compassion. These are skills, strategies, uh, really sometimes ways of being. These are all incredibly important, and they are very uncommonly taught. Training to focus one's attention, like we were talking about at the beginning, this doorknob strategy, although there's many, many other ways of learning how to do that. Learning to regulate one's emotions using both cognitive strategies and contemplative strategies. We'll talk about that in a minute. Training yourself in self-awareness, avoiding both projection and assumptions that the other person is actually thinking and feeling like you are. Metacognition, this is thinking about thinking. It's really the ability to be present in the moment and then at times to take a mini time out going up to the balcony, so to speak, to process what you're thinking and feeling and what others may be experiencing as well and how you're all affecting each other in the interactions that you're having. We also need to develop the relational skills for co-creating decisions that I think really transcends the concept of shared decision making. And it was beautifully exemplified in Sandra's story, training not just in communication, but in listening skills. Who ever heard of training people in listening skills, at least in medical school, not something I had. And then, of course, advocacy and uh, system navigation skills. All of these are some of the ways that we can learn, train ourselves, and educate others to provide compassionate care. And I'm going to hone in just on a couple of strategies. First, I wanted to just mention cognitive reframing. And this involves selecting which of many possible meanings that you choose to attach to a particular situation. 
And again, this is very much what Viktor Frankl and Csikszentmihalyi have talked about. So I'm going to share a clinical story about one of my primary care patients. I'm going to call her Mrs. D, and I had known her for many, many years uh, before she developed a uh, aggressive cancer. And I really love this woman. She was kind, loving, generous, humble. She went through just a barrage of chemotherapy. She had two craniotomies, multiple surgeries, and she was always smiling. And then we ex really ran out of possibilities to extend her life when we uh, engaged hospice, and I transitioned into being her, um, her hospice doc. And I would go visit her in her home. And she occupied this hospital bed in the center of her living room. She was surrounded by her kids and her grandkids all the time. It was kind of noisy, but she looked kind of happy, and she was comfortable. But she had one daughter who insisted that her mom not give up. And she wanted all kinds of things. She wanted us to insert a feeding tube and so forth. But her mom had made her wishes clear that she was not interested in heroic measures. And after she died, I was thinking about her quite a bit, and I got a phone call that this daughter wanted to see me. And she wanted to bring her dad, and she was incredibly angry. She insisted. I should have done more to prevent the progression of her mother's disease. And I just got really anxious and upset, started feeling defensive. And I got mad at her. And I spent just hours preparing for this. And then my practice partner spoke with her, and um, I was out of the office for a bit. And then he told me that he thought this doctor really just wanted to be sure she had been a strong enough advocate for her mom. And as I thought about this, I began to realize that because she had had so much trouble adjusting herself, giving herself up to the process of her mother's dying. This daughter had never been able to say goodbye to her mother. And the more I began to understand what her emotions might be, something just completely changed for me. And I decided that the most important thing I could do was just to be present and to bear witness to her grief. And in the end, she let go of her anger decided to grieve, and I let go of my anger and my anxiety, and I also let go of my self-judgment. And in retrospect, I can, I can see that using this strategy of empathic perspective taking, I was able to really reframe what was happening in a way that allowed me to be more compassionate with this daughter and also with myself. So I think it's an important strategy to keep in mind. I also want to talk about contemplative practice strategies. There is an awful lot of really interesting emerging research that suggests that mindfulness and compassion training through meditation and contemplative practices increases positive emotions and altruistic behavior. And we're actually going to be hosting some webinars on this type of training later on in our series. And I am not an expert by any means in this. I'm quite new to this. But this kind of focusing on the breath and then this kind of compassion training, this is a Buddhist meditation that's been practiced since ancient time. And it is included in some courses on mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindful communication. And I just loved it. So I'm, I am going to read it to you. I could not resist. So you can do this at home. Yeah, you can do it if you wish. You sit in a comfortable place, you can close your eyes if you want, and you repeat these words. You begin by directing this kind of compassion, loving kindness to yourself. May I live free from fear. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I live with ease. So you begin by cultivating this feeling of compassion for yourself, and then you extend it out to others a neutral person, a friend, a difficult person, a progressively enlarging circles of living beings. May you live free from fear. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you live with ease. I think that these strategies are fascinating, and the neuroscience behind them is fascinating. Uh, and so I would urge you to consider attending some of these future webinars coming up. I also want to show you this really interesting definition. This is a definition of self-compassion by Kristen Neff. And she is a psychologist who began doing research on this topic a decade ago. And she defines self-compassion as being touched by and open to one's own suffering. 
not avoiding or disconnecting from it, generating the desire to alleviate one's suffering and to heal oneself with kindness. Self-compassion also involves offering non-judgmental understanding to one's pain, inadequacies, and failures, so that one's experience is seen as part of the larger human experience. How lovely would it be to be able to actually offer this to yourself? It's a tall order for many of us who are kind of self-judgmental, compulsive, type A. But if you're interested, you can test your self-compassion on Kristen's website. And I'll, the link is down there, and it will be posted when we have our uh, handouts posted on our website if, you're, if you want to go there. Now, so far, we've been focusing on personal strategies uh, to deepen compassion. But we're social animals, and we all need social support. So let's not forget about the short center rounds. They are certainly wonderful, meaningful opportunities to share and discuss experiences and to give and to receive support. So let's just think about where we've been. We've been talking about this model of compassion with all of its various components and processes. And we've discussed some of our own personal strategies for strengthening resilience, those self-care strategies. We've talked about needing to prepare for compassion and the qualities and the skills that we need to develop to provide compassionate care, openness, respect, unconditional caring, kindness, presence, listening, relational, communication skills. We mentioned the need for balanced emotion regulation, which can be fostered through mindfulness training, cognitive reframing, and a variety of other strategies. And we discussed the need for self-compassion. There is so much to share and to learn from each other about each of these aspects of compassion and how to provide more compassionate care. And we're actually going to be spinning off topics from this model and from your suggestions for our webinars and other educational opportunities on the various aspects of the models and the skills necessary to provide compassionate care, beginning with a webinar by Dr. Helen Reese on teaching empathy. Uh, Ron Epstein will be offering a webinar on teaching mindfulness and communication. And Cinda Rushton is going to talk about managing moral distress and strengthening a resilience. We have lots of other ideas for terrific topics that you can see listed here. And we'll address many, many other topics as well. So let's remember out there, we can choose our own way. We can choose our own way, one that fills us with a sense of purpose and meaning. We can, and we have chosen, to serve and to heal. We can choose to provide and to promote compassionate care. So I think that we have some time for questions. Lynn, do you have some questions that uh, our, our listeners have sent in? Thank you, Beth. We do. I'm sh uh, let me start with, I'm sure our audience joins me in thanking you for sharing these um, wonderful insights with us. Um, if, to our audience, if you have a question you'd like to submit, you can still do so. I have four or five ready, but I will um, certainly be taking more. Just type your question into the questions pane on the right of your screen, and we'll answer as many as we can in the time that we have. Um, so Beth, our first question is, how can behavioral health clinicians best deliver compassionate care while respecting boundary concerns? Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I think the first thing is to really try to understand what boundary concerns are uh, and to understand this self-other distinction, which is so very, very important. It comes, I think, uh, it, it has to begin with understanding what belongs to us and what belongs to others and not projecting ourselves into other people's experiences and assuming that they are us or we them or that we think and feel the same way. So I think that takes a lot of self-examination and discussion with mentors, with teachers, with supervisors. I, I really think that's an important way to begin. And then really feeling comfortable with all of the qualities, the skills that we've discussed that are required to provide compassionate care. But I think having a good sense of your own boundaries first and trying to understand that self-other distinction, keeping it clear in your mind is, a, is an important first step. Excellent. Beth, thank you. Um, uh, second question, can you really teach compassion? 
Mm. This is a great question. I have to say I'm asked this question all the time. Here's what I'm going to say. My experience is I've taught students and house staff residents and stuff for many, many years. And all I can say is that, especially our, our students, our students come to us. They're filled with this very deep sense of compassion and a commitment to service. But what happens is when they get sent into clinical settings, especially hospitals, which is where they primarily train, they get socialized into this culture of medicine that's not always so compassionate. So in a way, I kind of think that the question is not, can we teach compassion? The question, I think, is how can we preserve and sustain the sense of compassion that our students come to us with? And then I think there are many ways to answer this question. First, I want to just say something that I think is important. It's been very important for me personally. Each and every one of you listening out there is a teacher. You cannot not teach. You are teaching all the time. You teach by the way you listen, by the way you interact with every single person you meet, everybody. We teach who we are. So if you want other people to be compassionate, you have to role model it yourself. Gandhi, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. Second of all, we have talked about a lot of qualities and skills that really are the foundation for compassionate care. Obviously, we can't go into all of these in detail, what they sound like, how you teach them. I have no doubt in my mind that these can be taught, and I know that they are learned. Uh, there are many different kinds of courses, uh, some that I'm just getting familiar with. The, the courses in mindfulness, mindful communication, which help people learn to focus their attention and deepen their compassion are fascinating to me. Uh, but there are also proven experiential methods that help people improve their communication skills that we've been teaching for years. There's a, a tremendous rich education and research literature about communication skills training. And then there are these group activities like the short turnarounds that sustain compassion. So I have no doubt at all that these qualities and skills can be modeled, they can be taught, they can be learned. I think the thing to think about is be, be compassionate. If you want others to be compassionate, be compassionate yourself. More Excellent. questions, Liz. There are lots coming in. Here we go. Um, yeah. Are there metrics to help measure compassion, or would we expect to see a patient satisfaction scores? Ah, this is really a great question. I love these questions. They're terrific. Um, here's, here's what I know. Many hospitals and clinicians and groups are using a standard set of, they're called patient experience measures. And they ask people to attest to the degree to which their patient experiences were OK for them, satisfactory for them. In these, there's stuff about um, the cleanliness of the rooms, the noise level. But there's also some sections on nurse communication and doctor communication. Um, there is one question in a widely two widely used surveys that ask about whether or not the doctor or, or the nurse listened to you. Uh, but you know what? There's nothing in these commonly used surveys that ask whether or not the team cared about them, whether they asked them about what their concerns were, whether they responded co to concerns, to distress. So I think there are lots of holes in our metrics that we're using now. And I would love to see these supplemented with items on these surveys that are used nat nationally and that are now being used to some extent as incentives to additional payments to clinicians groups and even hospitals. I'd love to see some compassion-related metrics added to these surveys. The rest of the uh, compassion types of instruments are used in research settings, but these are the only kinds of patient experience surveys uh, that are used uh, widely in hospitals and for clinicians and groups. By the way, these are now public re uh, being publicly reported. And I think the hope is that people will choose where they're going based on these surveys to some extent. So if we can get compassion-related metrics in there, it would be terrific. And we're hopefully going to try and work on that. Indeed. And, and this is a, a, Carrie, a segue to a, another version of that. Moving from volume-based health care to value-based health care is mm -hmm. really a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Physicians will no longer be providers, and patients will no longer be, quote, recipients of care, unquote. 
Rather, both will be co-participants. How do you see teaching empathy and compassion impacting this paradigm sh shift? I think it's going to be fantastic. First of all, it will remove this uh, stricture that we have to pump up the volume, which I think is just impossible. It is impossible to see patients quickly, quickly, quickly who are complex. I mean, I, I know primary care. That's where I come from. but. You know, it's very hard to see a complicated, especially an elderly patient, 10, 15 minutes, even 30 minutes, it's just, it's just not going to happen. And there actually, there has been research that's been done that has shown that patients can't really even get out what their real concerns and worries are in less than 18, 20 minutes. So getting away from that paradigm is terrific. It's going to be wonderful. To measure whether or not we are actually providing compassionate care in that kind of a setting. Again, people are working, or we hope people will help us work on developing new ways to measure compassion that we can put into these uh, instruments that are going to, in part, determine payment to clinicians, groups, and hospitals that will reflect some of the things that we think are important. Beth, you started to touch on this, and I just want to ask, we have time for one more question, and it's a okay. quick one, I hope. But what effect does limited time with patients have on the ability to be compassionate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I did start to talk about it. Um, I think, you know, I have, I'm of two minds about this. Because on the one hand, if you, you know, look at the stories that I told today. Ken Schwartz, this nurse came down. She held her hand in the operate just before he was wheeled into the operating room. That didn't take long. You look at Sandra's story, and right there in the text it said this interaction took five or six minutes. It completely changed her life, and probably the life of that pulmonologist, too, who interacted with her in such a meaningful way. So on the one hand, I think you can make these connections if you are prepared to make them. It gets back to preparation, which we were talking about in the webinar. You can do it, but again, when you think about some of the really complex issues that we have to deal with, particularly trying to sort through end-of-life decisions and having these conversations about goals of care, that cannot be done you know, in moments. We, we need time to have these kinds of conversations. So I'd have to say that the context and the content of the discussion influences my response. Wonderful. And speaking of that, <laughs> we have to come to the end of our program. Beth, you were terrific. Thank uh, you. To our audience, if you asked a question that we were unable to get to, those questions will be sent to our speaker, to Beth, and she'll do her best to get a response to you directly. I would again like to thank Beth for sharing her expertise and insights with us, as well as everyone in the audience for setting aside time in your busy day to participate. This concludes today's program. We would very much appreciate you taking a moment to complete the electronic survey upon exiting and we value your input and hope that you'll join us for upcoming programs in the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Care webinar series. Please visit www.theschwartzcenter.org for more details and look for our webinar email invitations. Thank you and have a great day.